Hey guys, my name is Cameron Radice. I'm an actor and headshot photographer based in Los Angeles, California, and I'm excited to be here on the Points of Experience podcast with Paul Castro. I know we've talked a lot about being an actor and how important it is to study acting and to just be so good you are undeniable. And if you've done your homework, then, you know, eventually opportunity, talent will be, meet the opportunity or preparation meets opportunity, whatever the way you phrase those two things. I always forget, but it's one of those things meets one of those other things and then you get a job. <laughs> Our guest today, Kevin Radice, uh, is a, an exceptional actor, one of the kindest human beings I've ever met in my life and a, I think one of the best headshot photographers in the world. That sounds crazy to say, but I truly kind of believe it. Where I've shot with some, I've shot with some of the best people. I've shot with some of the best photographers in the world. I've seen their work. And what Cameron does is he knows how to Jorah is saying hi. Thank you for the um for the feature on this one, Jorah, my cat. He he also agrees. Jorah agrees. How good Cameron and Savan are. Savan, his his partner at their photography studio. They they know what it is that casting directors and agents want. He works with them closely. He has conversations with these people and says, this is what we're looking for. This is what we can do for you. And they collaborate and find the best way to create the best shots for each actor. They create a game plan. They give you the resources, the tools to show up on game day and have a great shoot. Now, while they provide an, a beyond believable service when it comes to getting your headshots, there's a lot of responsibility on the actor, the person showing up for the headshots. And that's what we talk about in this episode. All the things that you need to do as the performer or anybody showing up and looking to get photos done to have the best experience. We talk about all the things that they're going to help you do from the backgrounds to the wardrobe, all those things in between. We talk about what they do and what he does and how they help make your job of, of presenting photos to these people a lot easier and better, you know, so you can put your best put, foot forward. But there's a lot that goes into your materials and what, what is going to help you get a job. And I'm excited to break that down because headshots are one of the, if not the most important tool um, in the business side of things where, you know, we talk about reels, websites, resumes, all that stuff. I think your headshot is truly and will always be your calling card. Granted, there are more than one calling card now. Having a demo reel is also very important too. And that's going to showcase you. But before you can even oftentimes get someone to look at your reel, the first thing they're looking at is your headshot. That is kind of um, your brand cover. And they are providing that service in multiple different ways where it's not just this one shot that you have. They're, they're able to kind of go the gamut and get all these different character shots for you so that when these opportunities come across, you have you know the right playing card to say, oh, you're looking for an ace today? I got an ace. You're looking for a king? I got a king. You're looking for a queen? I got a queen. It's such a great conversation. I'm so glad we got to touch upon the things that we do. Um, he's he's one of the... He has become such a great friend, and I'm just so privileged that um, he's invited me into his life and to allow him to have a, a conversation with him on the show. So I hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, Cameron Radice, and uh, yeah, another banger of a POX podcast episode. Um, stay tuned. So we were just talking about this brand new space, and I am so I I, I, I want to see it for myself because I know how exciting that is to walk into a new space that's yours and kind of like your playground. And you were telling me that you've got a bunch of new rooms and stuff, which is more than I think what your original operation was because it was just kind of like you were doing headshots in your room, but now you have all this extra space. So. What are what are some of the stuff that you think you, are you going to like function more as like a production company now? Is that like the goal, or is it like this is now your creative space to have creatives and do what you want to do? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Previously, we were shooting out of our home studio, and we had a good amount of space, and it was it was great and very functional, and um, it kind of added a little bit of like a a personal touch to what we do as headshot photographers. Um, but we just moved into a brand new space, like you said. We're really excited about it. It still has kind of that personal vibe. It's not like an industrial warehouse where you walk in. Yeah. It's just like 
cold and frigid. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, it's it's really great here. We've got we've got a lot more space. We've got rooms that we can branch off and do other things in. We've got a great green room, and our shooting studio right across the hall is. Uh, just excellent. It's a great big room and I got all the freedom to be as creative as I want to be now, which is awesome. Yes. But we're in here as of this week. Monday was our, our first day in the new space and, and we're loving it so far. So in, so in terms of like, because a lot of it is that, like we were saying, not in terms of like what you're, you were doing in your previous studio, but it's that Legos of making sure everything is right based upon like the environment that you're in. So I'm sure you knew your environment to a T. Like I put this flat here. I put this light here. How much of that oh. process are you still kind of like figuring out or is there like more depth for you to play with? Like what has that process been like and do you feel like you've, you've found the sweet spots yet or at least have a, a sense of where they are? <laughs> yeah. Um, I am such a creature of habit. Like, like you said, like my V flats go in a certain spot. My lights go in a certain spot. Everything kind of has a mark on the ground. And yeah. that's always my thing when I change locations or I uh, take what I do to a new space. I'm like, okay, how is this going to play out? Can I match everything that I do to a T? When people see my work online, I want them to know that when they come in, they can get that work as well. Yes. Regardless of where I'm shooting. And so I got here and, um, you know, on day one, we're just, we're loading everything in and everything's just, you know, packed up in crates and light stands piled everywhere. And I'm like, whew, okay. Um, where are my marks? (laughs) (laughs) Like that's my first go-to. I'm like, I break out the measuring tape. I know where my, my key lights sit. I know where my flags go. I know where the client stands for headshots. And then I, I mark my ground and I start building around that to a T exactly the way I had it in my previous space. Mm. So, so you, you've got the blueprint. I yeah. I got the blueprint. I got the blueprint. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's so amazing. And this is one of the things I kind of love about you. And I think this is why, I mean, just to give people a little background here. And obviously in the intro, I'll be talking about all of your, your great stuff that you do. But the thing that I love about people like you and I think why I, I, I loved shooting with you when I first came to LA, I got recommended to go to you guys to do you and Savon who run Cameron Redice Photography to do my headshots when I came out here and I instantly vibed with both of you, you and Savon who is your partner and your fiance. Yes. Uh, you know, so like I, I, I think that when I when I worked with both of you both of you when the first time I met you guys, I was like, they have that same vibe that I love that I love when I was coming from kind of like New York people who You know, you're both actors and then you have this entrepreneurial spirit, which I think is so important for people to have pursuing any form of art. You know, it's it's great to be an actor and be an artist. And I think that carries with you to everything you do. But with you and I think what you guys provide is an understanding of what an actor needs, what's important in a headshot and all of those things. And I I just truly saw that you guys have that analysis of the industry and Mm -hmm. analysis of what's important for, for an actor. And I think, so there's people who take great photos and a a whole headshot experience. And you'll be able to maybe hopefully weigh in here is um, it's more than just showing up in front of a camera. Yeah. Especially as an actor, you know, I mean, for, you know, if you're a real estate agent, maybe there's a different process or uh, a Mm -hmm. different bar that's needed, but you're still (laughs) trying to sell a service. And I think as an actor, you're trying to sell yourself. So um, I know I said a lot right there and I wanted to make sure that I (laughs) I, uh, explained how we got to know each other. And, and, uh, you know, James Austin Kerr, who I did Neo The World Ends With You With, as many people here listening who are fans of of mine. James is a great friend of Savon and I's. Yeah. 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 And and so all the dots kind of connected. Yeah. A fantastic actor uh, and and an amazing voice, too. Uh, You know what? You know what? And something that's, you know, just kudos to you. You came in. You're you were our favorite type of actor to work with. Hmm. Um, You came in. You were ready to play. You were ready to, to, to bring whatever you could to the table to meet us in the middle. Yeah. And Savan and I always feel that that's when the magic happens. Um, you know, there's some, some actors that maybe are, are a little bit newer to the industry or have never had a headshot session before. And they come into a shoot expecting everything to come from the photographer's side. And yeah. while we can light you and we can give great direction and we can kind of find you and, and kind of, you know, bring out the best in you. It's always wonderful when you meet us in the middle yeah. and you are ready to play. You're ready to be creative and quite frankly, ready to act like headshots is a form of acting as well that I think um, kind of slips by some actors. They, they come in and 
they don't know that they gotta find those thoughts. They gotta find mm -hmm. the character thoughts and the motivations behind what the looks are. And then actually connect with the camera just like you would on set in a scene. And when you came in, like, man, you took all the direction to a T, you locked in, you found the character looks, and the energy was there. And I think five clicks in, someone and I kind of looked at each other like, this is going to be a good shoot. It's going to be a great shoot. <laughs> oh, you flatter me. And, and honestly, I've been, I've shot with a lot of people, especially in New York. You know, I, I don't know if I've talked to, I've told you this multiple times, but, you know, I became friends with uh, a guy named Damien Battinelli, who was, uh, is the retoucher for, um, Peter Hurley, who is a very famously known uh, photographer in the industry in New York City, and I've worked with him and uh, many other headshots photographers in New York in my ten years in in my, <laughs> in, my in the industry. You know Taylor Hooper, um, many other people who are great. You know photographers, but something that I thought that you guys really had down to a T was understanding that what the use of this photo was. You know, yeah. like it, it, and sure. and when you're an actor. You're, you're presenting a still image in your headshot, but what you're getting cast for is the moving image. So right, right. How, how, can you, how can you get across somebody who has life in, in whatever that photo has? Mm -hmm. And I felt like you you in your direction, Savon in the art direction and, and just the, uh, you know, everything that went into it, I feel like so much personality was put into it. Do you feel like you have a process that you've deciphered at this point to, okay, this is how we shoot people or has it just become so much of like this, um, improvisational beast at this point where you just understand what's right for the person or what's right for everything. Or do you have kind of like a checklist of things that go into your, to your shoots? Yeah. I, I mean, we definitely have our own style of shooting and our own process that we kind of, um, use as our baseline. When somebody comes in though, a big part of our job is to figure out who that person is. Mm -hmm. and how they communicate through an image. Um, and it's usually, you know, the first few snaps, I start to get an idea for, you know, what their angles are, um, how much expression they're going to throw at the camera, what kind of connecting or what kind of thoughts they'll give me. And then I kind of tailor the shoot after that to kind of match what suits them. Yeah. Um, I would say that I'm a little bit of a technical director when it comes to, to headshots. I think matching, um, or not matching, uh, hitting the marks just right adds to the photo and to the composition and what story we're telling. But I don't lock people into like real strict like poses, if that makes sense. I kind of sure. guide people loosely and softly, let them find what feels comfortable. And then if I've got an actor that loves to play, I'll usually throw character thoughts their way. Uh, we had a guy just the other day that um, did a bunch of improv and uh, just a great spur of the moment type of actor. Like improv actors say yes to everything, right? You throw them yeah. an idea and they have to say yes to it and roll into, you know, wherever they're going to take it. And so he came in and I was like, great, this is an actor that I can play with. And mm -hmm. so every few clicks, I'd throw him another idea or another line of dialogue. And then he'd respond and give me the look that I was going for. Mm. Um, so it kind of depends on who I'm getting, you know, I get others that are a little bit more of the stoic theatrical types where, you know, they're, their bread and butter is that lock in with the camera and that squeeze in the eyes, almost like they've got um, a secret or an inner story to tell. And that is the best kind of headshot is when you can see somebody's eyes and know there's a story behind them. Yeah, yeah, no, know. That's I, I, I think the people who can translate that story that they're telling the camera or they're, they're with their if the camera becomes their scene partner in a way right. and if you get that story whether that whatever that is whether that's you know I love you or I'm going to beat the shit out of you or you, you know whatever <laughs> exactly. that is like th that smirk changes depending upon who you uh make that scene partner the camera or even if it's you or whoever you're improving you know with at the time you know whatever that back and forth is is so much different than saying like okay um big smile you know, like exactly. big smile is, is, is a great, is a great note to put you somewhere. But the, as the actor, that's kind of like where that, um, meeting halfway is. Cause as you, as an actor, what is creating that smile? Right. You know, that's right. the way I, I, I view things. And I see like, when I see great work, I'm like, okay, that person's probably a good actor. A good totally. a headshot often comes from a good actor. Do you it feel does. that way? It does. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we get some people in here and I know, you know, in the middle of the session, I'm like, okay, this, this guy or this gal can act. Um, mm -hmm. You just get that sense, um, and it, and it's because on my end, I'm seeing everything that happens between the frames, right? Yeah. I'm in the camera and I'm watching the thoughts change, and I'll throw them a note or some direction, and I'll literally watch them sift through, find it, and then reconnect with me. 
And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, you're finding that motivation. You're finding the character that we're going after. You're not just coming in with wardrobe and saying, yeah, this is the character, now you make it happen. You're doing <laughs> yeah. the homework behind the scenes, and I see the transition between the clicks. I'm like, okay, yeah. this is fun. That's the difference between, I think, someone who is like almost a set piece where it's like, yeah, that looks like the character. They're wearing the cop uniform, Mm -hmm. but who, what is the thing that's behind that that makes you unique? And I think the ultimate mystery or of, of what books people from headshots to begin with, or what gets someone called in or what someone gets someone an agent. It's that the, like you were saying, the mystery Mm -hmm. or whatever's underneath that. And I think if you don't bring that as an actor to a headshot session, it's you're doing yourself a disservice because Totally. I yeah. mean, your headshot is your calling card in a sense. It's yeah. the first thing the casting sees when they're posting up a role and you get thousands of submissions. First of all, those headshots are this big each. They're tiny mm-hmm. and there's just thousands of them. And A, you got to pop off the screen and B, you got to be telling a story with your eyes and with your expression. Whatever you're, whatever you're selling, it's got to come through. Yeah. Um, like you said, wearing the wardrobe isn't just enough because I can throw on a cop uniform and I can just stare at the camera. But what is it saying? Is this a cop that's in a comedy sitcom like Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Is mm-hmm. this a cop that's in Blue Bloods and it's way theatrical prime time? What are you telling with the look? Yeah. Um, or are you going for both? Are you an actor that, that does comedy really well, but you can also lock in and do the drama? Um, you got to kind of do your own homework before you come into a photo shoot so that you know what you want to bring to the table. Because um, yeah. it all plays. It all plays. Well, this is, I mean, I know I want to get more into this, but I would love to take a jump back for a second because um, there's so many questions. I mean, uh, just from knowing you and I've heard things from James and you've said things too. Like, I know that you did like magic when you were a kid (laughs) and like, I'm just so fascinated about hearing more about this stuff. And I would love to give people a little insights to kind of your, how you got started in, in this industry, where you found your love for performance and for acting and eventually for filmmaking. I would love to just give people kind of a, an inside look to say like, okay, this is the things that I'm interested in my life. What are the steps you took to kind of get you to where you are today as quickly or as elaborated as we, we find, uh, as we, as we come across <laughs> to, to finding out. But so as a kid, yeah. where, where was that <clears throat> first moment? And this is something I ask most people is what was that first moment where you recognized whether it was acting or filmmaking or performing, that you had an affinity or a desire uh, for whatever that whatever that was for you. What was the first instance where you were like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm watching this and I want to be this or sure. whatever that was? Um, to be totally frank, it was my dad. I, I watched my dad growing up as a little kid, and my dad was always this larger than life, animated. Um, guy and 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 i always was like i want to be just like my dad and my dad was in radio when i was growing up he was like a 20-year legend in my hometown everybody knew who dean radice was it was like oh you're dean radice you're you're on you're on the radio we know exactly who you are and like as a kid growing up i was like yeah my dad's a star (laughs) and i was like um you know I, i wanted to just be like my dad and my dad's like you know why don't i bring you into the studio let's do some voiceover work And as a kid, I didn't know what that entailed yet, but he brought me into his radio station and I would learn how to do voice spots and splice things together. And then, you know, pretty soon I ended up doing radio ads for Sesame Street Live and, uh, you know, toy stores that were local in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I just got used to going into the studio, into the recording booth and doing voiceovers for these different companies or shows or, or kids events or something like that. And I loved it. And I loved creating the energy behind the voiceover and Mm. the magic behind the presentation. And I mean, I was six years old, but I loved it. And it was right around that same time that uh, my mom for my birthday hired a magician to come and perform for me and all my friends. I turned six and this guy came in with his little suitcase, you know, his stool, opened it up, did the little cards and coins. It was just like a little like kid's birthday party, magic show. Uh I fell in love with that and I was like, okay, that's another style of performing. I'm really into this. So my mom kind of took over from there and nurtured that aspect. And over the years, mom and I would go to these magic conferences and I would grow and learn more on that side. And then pretty soon I was doing stage shows at children's events in town. And I'm like eight, nine years old at this point, And I'm doing magic on stage for hundreds of people. And I didn't let that go, it kept going. And um, I think I performed on stage until I was about 
17 or 18 years old. And it grew to the point that I was doing, you know, fire and birds and levitations and disappearing on the stage and reappearing in the back. It was like large scale form magic. And we were kind of traveling different places in the country to do it. And I was like, this is a style of performing that I love because, you know, it's a presentation on the stage. So I took what I learned in voiceover and delivering a message and brought it to a platform um, yeah. in front of people live. But it was also, there was this element of showmanship and pizzazz and magic to it. And I loved it. And, you know, all the while growing up, um, another form of magic that I thought was always fascinating to me was movie making. And that kind of kicked off back in my dad's world again. He showed me Batman from 1989 when I was a little kid. And that mm -hmm. was the piece of content that I was like, not only do I want to be Batman, I want to make Batman movies. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, so I grew up always having a camera on my shoulder, always asking my friends to make films with me. Some of them loved it. Some of them were like, dude, yeah, yeah. enough. Let's go outside and, and skate. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was my kind of life too, is I fell in love with, I, I had always had my, similarly, my dad loved movies, okay. loved comedy. We have a very similar thing too, because my dad was also a big Batman fan as well, was and it? I okay, became obsessed yeah. with Batman. I also very irrationally developed a fear of bats because when I was camping with my friends once I was like there was a like a piece of bark in the dark on the ground and I picked up this like huge piece of bark that I thought was bark but it was actually a bat oh my and gosh. I picked it up and a bat was like fluttering in my face and ever since I was like <laughs> and I and I started screaming like ah! Running through the woods at the middle of the night, my friends had made fun of me for a long time, you, and I you became. You could have grown up to be Batman, then. I, you had I know. the like the fall in the cave moment. You had it. Yep, I know, <laughs> I know. It's and but and I've always loved Bat. For for my high school graduation, I wore a Batman cape underneath my gown, and I took it out and I yes. ran off the stage. I, I'm a huge Batman fan. That's fell in awesome. love with with movie making the same way, but I did my stuff through skateboard videos. So that's how kind okay. of like my filmmaking journey began. Was just like like my parents had one of those old DV. Uh, video camera, yeah, the little like, mini DVD tapes. Yeah, so yeah. I started on that. What was like for you? What was? The, how did you wind up getting your first camera? How did you know to get like a camera? Like when did that process start? Yeah, um, it's funny. I've got a timeline in my head because I never forgot these big moments. And it was Christmas morning. I woke up and Santa had brought me my first camera, <laughs> and it was a yeah. Tyco video cam, and it was this gray brick, and it recorded black and white video, but it had to be connected to a VCR. So it would, it would have like a 20-foot line that would RCA cables go into the back of a VCR. And mm -hmm. you'd have to press record on the VCR tape. And it would take the footage and put it on the VCR tape. Perfect. <laughs> so every movie I made when I was like seven, eight years old had to be within – uh, earshot of a TV and a VCR. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. But, so they're all living room stories. War is in the living room. It's, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> but it was kind of funny, you know. Growing up, it was always like there was, there was voiceover with dad and 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 Batman and acting with dad, and then there was magic um, and filmmaking on the other end of the spectrum, and it all kind of intertwined and and grapevine throughout my life growing up. And I graduated high school, enrolled in film school to study cinematography and directing. And then I, after I, after that, I was like, I got to get to LA. I was like, there's, uh -huh. there's only so far you can take this in Colorado Springs. I was uh -huh. like, I got to jump to LA. That's the big pond and, and see what happens. And I've been here for 10 years now. Wow. Okay. Wait. So, so you, you're 17 or 18 mm -hmm. and you've been, you've been doing, uh, like illusions. You were an illusionist, right? That's the, Correct. Yep. the category that you were working in, in the terms of magic and magicians. But so you're, you're doing that up to like 17 high school. You graduate at 18, 17 or something like that. Right. That's yep. when people graduate. 18, 18, so, 18. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And then, so from there you decided you're going to pursue filmmaking in college and you went to like a film, like a film school or a college university to do that. Where, where did yep. you go to? to film yep. school? Um, I basically graduated high school. Um, at that time I was like, okay, I think, I think, you know, I want to shift perspective a little bit to another form of magic in my mind, which was filmmaking. Sure. And movie magic, movie magic. Exactly. And, um, I already had a good understanding for, you know, the process behind it. Cause it was kind of self-taught growing up. But mm -hmm. I was like, I, no, I want to know the business side of it, which is the entrepreneurial side that you're talking about before. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to study um, cinematography, writing and directing specifically. Those mm. are the elements that I want to focus on. I want to know how to light somebody and I want to know how to direct somebody. Mm. And I, I went up to the Colorado Film School there in Denver 
and it's a great program. I studied there for um, a few years, graduated in 2011. Okay. And um, after that, I was like, well, I can stay in Colorado and I can make uh, car commercials or I can jump ship and move to LA and pursue something bigger, um, either on the acting or the filmmaking side. Um, but I always knew, you know, if I want there to be no limitations on where I can take myself, mm -hmm. I got to go to where the magic happens. Um, so like I'm, I'm getting out of town. I moved in, in 2012, packed wow. my stuff in my little, in my little car, drove out, lived on an air mattress, had my 32 inch TV on the floor of my apartment for the first year. And that, that was it. <laughs> oh man. That's, I am so I'm, I, I kind of did a similar thing, but it's not the same because I lived in Jersey and New York was just a, you know, a stone's throw away. So mm -hmm. like while I had a similar experience, it's not the same as kind of being somewhere that's multiple hours away from uh, a city and just picking up everything at that young of an age and going because you're still like figuring yourself out at 21, 22, whatever oh, age you were, you know what I mean? For sure. Yeah, you don't really know who you are at 18 yet. I mean, you're still, no, I mean, you're just I'm still figuring it out now. I'm yeah. still figuring it out now, yeah. <laughs> so it's crazy to kind of have taken that leap. And before you even get to LA, though, you had been doing like acting stuff, though, right? Or modeling, or you were doing commercials. From what yep. I've read, you were, you were already kind of found yourself into that boat. How did you find yourself getting into castings and doing that stuff that it just happened to you or did you pursue that that I, that uh, form of things yeah i i pursued it in colorado um when i was going through uh film study uh, i was like you know i can i can pursue in front of the camera at the same time and while there's not a large market in colorado there is a market um there are modeling agencies and commercial agencies and stuff like that and I ended up pitching my stuff to one of the larger um, commercial print agents in the Denver area. And she brought me in and with literally no credible experience on her resume, she's like, okay, I'll give you a shot. Let's, let's do this. I was like, cool. I had no idea what that meant. I was like, great. I have an agent. I've made yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like, most people think. Yeah. Yeah. I've made it. Um, so while I was studying film, they'd be sending me out to castings in the Denver area. Uh, and, and they'd be everything from like um, magazine, like product photography where, you know, you'd wear different apparel and showcase different products for a company um, to promo spots for stars and encore I did. There was a great one though that I got that got me my um, union eligibility in Colorado actually. Wow. And, yeah, it was a... Uh, it was a, a, a Colorado lottery spot. It was SAG and she got me the audition for it. I went in and they were looking for a vampire. That's what they wanted for the spot. And, but like a really like mystical, magical, I'll say kind of, uh, character. And so I went in and kind of did my thing. They pair you up with somebody just like they do here. And we, we did it, and the director looks at me, he's like, you don't change a thing. And he takes the girl, and I felt so bad. He's like, okay, I'm going to have you step out, bring in such and such, brought her in. I was like, okay. They brought in somebody else, paired me up, mm. and they're like, that was perfect. That's great. Okay, we'll be in touch. I was like, okay. Two days later, my agent called me in Denver. She's like, hey, you booked it. It's a SAG spot. It shoots on this day and this time. They're flying out the guy that does the True Blood show to do your, your makeup and your prosthetics and the whole thing. I was like... Oh man, this is so cool. Like Colorado kid, I got an LA team coming out to do this commercial with me and it's going to make me union eligible. That's, that's awesome. That's huge. It was huge for me at the time. And we did the spot. It ends up being this like high end looking, it looks like a cologne ad, honestly, not a, um, lottery, a lottery commercial. Yeah. 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 But I did that. And that was the biggest gig that I got. Um, when I was, when I was doing my work in Colorado, and it got me my eligibility, and I hung on to that until I moved here and, and joined the union. But it was a great gig. So there was a market for me in Denver. Um, yeah. And then, you know, once I kind of hit those stepping stones, I was like, great, now, now we'll move to the bigger market. That's an important uh, marker, I think, for people to recognize because – not everybody has the means or uh, the the possibilities of moving to a big city. Whether you know whether that's they have family or the, you know a job, whatever their kind of restrictions might be, it's uh, or they're just so green to whatever part of the industry they're pursuing. They might look at something like New York or Boston or LA, 
Georgia now, even if, you know, trying to do filmmaking or acting and think like, I want to move to these cities. I do find a lot of value in working within a smaller market and seeing how, how you stand up against other people, how you understand the process, because for a lot of people, you fall in love with something like, let's take uh, acting, for example. Yeah. And you're like, I would love to be on Brooklyn Nine Nine. I love this sense of humor. I'm so funny with my friends. I want to be an actor. That looks like they're having such a great time. But you don't realize that that's that's like the gift you get after a life of kind of figuring out how to survive in a big city yeah. and doing auditions and paying for coaching and getting headshots and yep. making your website with site There's doing so your resume. There's so much work that goes on behind it. Before yeah. the big break, everyone that, you know, like, oh, that was an overnight success story. Probably not. It was no. probably not an overnight success. It was probably 10 years in the making of busting your butt every day, putting the work in, making the connections, learning the business, learning yourself, yeah. honestly. Because, um, yeah, I think I think something else that, that tends to happen for a lot of actors in L.A., there's a lot of people that move here. And maybe they've got a great look um, and they find a great agent right away. And that agent starts putting them into big audition rooms right up front. Yeah. But maybe that particular actor is not ready for those big rooms yet. Like, I feel like we all move here thinking we're ready for it. It's yeah. like, I'm moving to LA. I'm going to book something big. You know, I'm going to audition. Mm -hmm. um, but I've heard countless times of actors getting into big, big rooms when they get here and they're not ready for it. Their training isn't up to snuff yet. They, they haven't. Um, learned enough about themselves and what they bring to the table yet. And and it's possible that you burn those bridges for a little while because yeah. you went in there and you weren't prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say you don't ever get back into those rooms, but I think a big thing for actors is when you make that move, when you move to a bigger market or you want to get into this business, the biggest thing is is to train. You've got to have your tool set sharpened and and know what you're bringing to the table. Um, you can't just show up and expect to book the next big movie. So you got to put in the work, you know? <laughs> yeah. So do, do you feel that? And then just for yourself, I mean, you had years <clears throat> of performing, you know, on stage already before you even, even probably were pursuing any of these uh, odd acting commercial auditions. So having an, understand, an understanding of what it's like to perform in front of an audience is such a radical different feeling than performing just in, you know, in your living room, just being able to, to know that there's people watching me, there's a camera crew, there's a whole team, like getting over that. I, I think as you know, we've been doing this for a while, you kind of, it's easy to forget those first moments where you're like, this is an entirely brand new experience. Like, I'll never forget just because I don't do it all the time. The first time I ever did stand-up comedy. I'll never yeah. forget that. Like, that feeling of going on stage so different than doing, like, a play or oh, a yeah. movie or whatever. Like, these different feelings of going up in front of people and performing and being able to be your most truthful, authentic, and vulnerable self. Do you feel like, for you, having had performed before doing magic and stuff, that is what prepared you? And Because, obviously, you have a great look and you're very good-looking guy and that helps i think you know to some degree i would Just imagine <laughs> yeah but you know but but you have to i think what what sets you what i have to believe i'm just assuming here you know like these first jobs you're getting is this person knows how to work in front of a crew of people or a camera do you feel like that yeah. that's maybe what set you apart yeah and honestly that was one of my big objectives in studying film was i wanted to be an actor that would show up on set and understand everybody else's position there Mm -hmm. um, I think the more I understand everybody else's job, the more I can be of benefit to what we're capturing and what we're creating. And <clears throat> so, yeah, I think, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and, and a big part of why I took the route that I took, but at the same time, performing magic on stage is a totally different mindset and beast than yeah. performing a, um, a scene that is intense or, uh, minimalist or between two people and it's just locking in shutting the world out listening and and you know being a real human being mm -hmm. um, you know when you're on stage it's it's larger than life right it's you're you're speaking to the person in the back row as much as you are the person in the front row and so everything's a little bit bigger and bolder and you know especially on the magic front Everything's got a little bit of pizzazz, you know? Mm. Um, but then you, you step onto a, a, a drama, a TV show, and it's you and it's the lead actor, and it's your close-up, and you're right here 
well, you're not playing big anymore. You're not putting that pizzazz into it. You gotta be a real human being. You gotta lock in, you gotta find those real thoughts and those real emotions. And I think the biggest thing on the acting side versus the stage side is listening because the real performance comes between the lines of dialogue. It's not necessarily just the black ink on the page. It's the white between the black ink. That's where the performance really kicks uh, mm. kicks in. And so I think channeling those two different mindsets was tricky for me initially um, because I had done magic and stage performing for 16 years of my life. And so that was a big thing. I always did you know, my own acting on the side and everything. But when I moved here and I started studying at this great studio in Hollywood, I was like, okay, I need to tone it back and listen. Yeah. And once I found my beats there, everything kind of started opening up. Totally. So it's just totally. a different beast. It's, it's a totally different mentality. It's a different thought process, you know? Yeah. Well, that was going to be even my next question is, so at what point when you moved to LA, <laughs> what was the strategy? What did you in your mind think like, because obviously you're SAG eligible, but it wasn't like you were SAG eligible and my contract is waiting for me. What was right. your kind of mindset or game plan to say, I'm moving to the city and now I'm pursuing this? What, what did you, what were the routes that you took or taking classes? What was your kind of game plan when you got here? I think we're all, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, but mm -hmm. I think we're all a little bit naive at first I was for sure yeah. yeah like like I remember telling you know friends and, and family at home I was like yeah I'm moving to LA in, in January I'm gonna start auditioning for all kinds of stuff <laughs> and they're like man that's that's so cool man good luck to you and yeah. I'm like thanks dude Just thanks. a couple of weeks and you'll see me on you know yeah, exactly uh, exactly yeah. <laughs> and um I moved here and, and when you get to a place like LA there's a certain magic of being here and the possibility that, I just said this to James last night, the possibility that t your tomorrow might change your everything. Yeah. And that's such uh, an electric feeling to have when you get here. And it doesn't matter if you live in a closet or on the floor with a blow up mattress or in the trunk of your car, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are here because there's a certain magic that's um, just incredible. Yeah. And. But with that comes the 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 the, the naive side, right? Because you get here and you're like, Spielberg's gonna call me. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> like I know it. And it was interesting for me because I had actually won a couple of large scale acting competitions while living in Colorado right before I moved here, and that was kind of my kickstart to be like, okay, pack your bag and get to L.A. There was one that came up for a big acting acting studio in Hollywood, and they did this worldwide casting search for an actor and they had everyone read this monologue and thousands of people submitted to it and I got a call and I was like we're choosing you and and the winner is flown to LA for a two-week intensive at this acting studio and it was a worldwide competition and I was like you're choosing me okay great wow. so I won <laughs> that's and crazy yeah so I, I got that I came out to LA for two weeks did this at acting intensive that's where I really learned, you know, the casting process out here and kind of found my bases a little bit. Went back to Colorado again, entered another contest that came out. And it was for um, some large film festival. But they did this acting competition where it was like, we're going to find the top five undiscovered actors that are up and coming. Yeah. And they ran this competition, another uh, nationwide competition, and I submitted for that. It was like a, it was like the early days of self-taping. It's like mm -hmm. no one really did self-tapes in 2010, but yeah. that's what it was. I submitted that, waited a few weeks, got another call. And they're like, you, you won. You're one of the five actors that we're going to list and, and award this top five undiscovered. I was like, oh my gosh, okay, so that's two things in a row, and I'm not two in LA Two for two. Yet. Two wow. for two. And it was also right around the time I got that vampire commercial and got my union eligibility. I was like, okay, the stars are kind of aligning, at least in yeah. my head they are. And I feel like I should, I should jump on this and pack my stuff and move out. So I got here, first thing I did was I jumped into an acting class. It was like a weekly thing that I went to and it was kind of a scene study audition technique class, which was great because it, it, it allowed me to open up my mind to what's allowed in the audition room, yeah. what kind of power you actually hold. And when you walk in, you're not just the subject of whatever they want. You're bringing what you are and saying, this is who I am. This is how I interpret the character. 
if we align, we'll work together. If not, it's totally fine. But yeah. that mentality shift needed to happen early on too. So I, I, I moved here, I joined an acting class. Um, and then, like I said, I, I my naive side um, started submitting to agents and I did get an agent at the time. Um, and I was like, great, I'm repped, I'm in class and I'm in LA. Sounds good. I'll binge watch Lost on Netflix in my apartment and wait for those auditions to roll in. <laughs> wait for that phone call. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah. Wait, I'll wait for the phone call. Yeah. Which, you know, that doesn't, that never came. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, I mean, so, I was the same way. I thought I was going to have the same career as Michael J. Fox. You know, I was like, all right, a couple years, I have to just wait till I'm 24 and then I'll get my series. You know, it's fine. I'll yeah. wait the two years and then, you know, I'll be on a hit sitcom and then all things will be good. And you quickly realize that. It, and I think it's even more prevalent now because of social media. We and, and, and the algorithm feeds you the most glittery thing. And it does happen for such... Like it, when you see that these things happen for people, like people blow up on TikTok or whatever it is, sure, it happens. But it yeah. is like... Point zero 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 one percent of people that have that luck strike. But we see it. Yeah as if it seems so attainable and it is it is if you work hard you can you can do things to dec- you know increase that percentage you know you can get into a class that bumps up the percentage you can mm-hmm. you know work on your mental health or your physical health that bumps up your percentages like there's things you can do to right. increase your possibilities of, of becoming successful i believe but just you know making a video and then overnight it blowing up sure it can but it more than likely will not So even if you have all the talent in the world, even if you are the most talented person. Yeah, even if you do go viral with something. I mean, when I moved here, the whole concept of going viral over the night overnight with like a goofy video or something, you know, a trendy thing, that wasn't even really a thing. And and now, you know, at least for a while, I don't know if they still are as heavy on it as they were, but casting directors were even looking at like your following count. They're looking Mm -hmm. at your Instagram and your TikTok and your YouTube page and saying like, what kind of audience do you bring with you? Like if we cast you, what audience are you bringing to our project? Yeah. Um, But that's the thing too. Like you can go viral overnight and be a a social media sensation in a sense, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can book and work on professional acting jobs. Like, have you done the homework? Do you know um, what hitting your mark means? Do you know how to find your character? Do you know how to find your moment before? Do you know how to do the homework? Mm-hmm. So um, I think they're just different beasts altogether, you know? Yeah, you could record a video and go viral to the tune of 7 million views tomorrow. And that's awesome. And you might make a living on social media now. Now that's possible. Um, but it's just very different than putting in the work and pursuing a really serious career in film and TV. Because acting is a craft, and I mean filmmaking, they're all crafts, and social media is its own separate craft, and I think you have to... I am very envious of people that, like I was saying, you, where we we pursue different disciplines within kind of the same realm. And I think that there's a... I think that makes you the most... Have, have the possibility for the longest career is when you are adaptable and you understand how the whole machine works. Like you were saying, you wanted to know how to light somebody. You wanted to know yeah. how to write. These things are so critical, I think, to have a long-lasting career. And it's so funny because I just made our previous video. We talked about doing kind of – because the question I get all the time is how do you become an actor? How do you get into voice acting? I, this is like it is the – the re, and we just put this video out and we're kind of touching upon these same key principles. And I'm very happy because it reinforces the same sentiment yeah. is you have to understand what goes into being an actor. You know, right. have to know how to do that homework – Anyone can say lines. Yeah. And it seems, yeah. and that's, it, the allure is it seems so easy. Right. Anyone can do these things. Anyone can get a camera and take a photo. It seems so easy. Yep. But you're paying for the thing and you're hiring for the person who knows how to work in between that invisible, subconscious, you know, uh, it, it, you know, anyone can stand on a skateboard with the help of somebody, but how can you manipulate that board to do a 360 exactly. flip or something? So Right, right. No, it, you're 100%. It's, there are so many layers to this. Um, and having a well-versed mindset is beneficial in so many ways. Even, yeah. as, even just as an actor. Let's say you don't have the cinematography training or you know, film school training or, or even just film set 
you know, experience as an actor, what skill sets can you go out and teach yourself or learn that you can add to your resume and that you can bring to the table for a character or for um, an audition or what, whatever, you know? It's something as simple as, do you know how to drive a stick shift? You know, like little skills, little skills yeah. like that where, um, you know, if like you're- James with the horseback riding and I thought that was James. just so brilliant, you know? And, and that's something that I have always admired about James. He's always out there learning something new. Yeah. If he, want, if he sees it and he's like, I gotta learn how to do that. He's the dude that goes out there and teaches himself how to do that, yeah. you know? Um, whether that's horseback riding or flying a, an airplane. A plane, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's awesome, really? though. Like, yeah. you should be well-versed as an actor because as an actor, you are inhabiting the lives of all these characters, right? Mm -hmm. And these characters that you are living the life of for a moment or for the duration of a film or whatever have full and complete backstories. They have yep. lives. They have their own skills. They have their own memories their own and that's what you need to tap into on your end to step into shoes of somebody else so i just think the more versed you are the the better off you are um and yeah. you can bring more to the table um in any aspect really it reminds me of kind of why movies like top gun maverick is one of the most successful movies that we've seen oh, in this so recent good. day and age yeah but i think it's because you know anybody can play the role of a pilot anyone yep. can can do that but someone like Tom Cruise, who has made his whole life, you know, obsessively about like these planes and, and action sports and understanding what goes into these people's lives is what changes that same movie with a different actor to him and, and how he's doing his own stunts. And, you know, yeah. whether you're not a fan of that or not, it's what makes that whole movie and that whole process so endearing and why you kind of fall in love with the characters in the story because totally. there's so much put into it. And Tom's, I mean, if you love his movies or not, he's, you got to give him kudos for, uh -huh. for everything that he does. I mean, he's, he is an action guy to the core and he will get out there and do it himself, which is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, Top Gun Maverick, by the way, I just got to say, awesome movie. I love the movie. I, I, I felt, I, I was not expecting what yeah. I was expecting when I walked into that, to that movie. Cause I was like, yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be fine. But I literally, I left that. I was in, I was in that movie for this whole, the whole time like this. I just, yeah, it's larger than life. That's, that's what you want out of a movie going experience. You know, yeah. I feel like I walked out of there going like, dang, I feel like a kid again. That was just yeah. awesome. And it inspired me as an actor to want to have that commitment to do that kind of homework right. or to be that passionate about life and things and to it like and just making films in general because there's just so much cool stuff visually about that movie and cinematically yeah. it's a it's a real masterpiece of of incorporating what is like some of the highest technology and the coolest stuff, you know, the fastest planes in the yep. world and making a great story out of something that seems so kind of uh, bells and whistle, -y, you know, yeah. like to, to marry all of the great talents that go into why that movie is successful. I think and how really... cool is that for the actors in a movie like that? I think that's one of the, the best things about this craft is that this is not a nine to five job where you're going in and you're doing the same thing every day. Yeah. Every day you step on set is a different new experience. Mm -hmm. And an opportunity to learn something new and yeah. and live something different. And I think that was like the biggest draw for me in filmmaking. I was like, every scene can be different. Every day can be new. Everything you go and um, capture can be uh, just a completely different experience. And that's part of the magic too about this business is, yeah. okay, great. So today, call time, we are on the interior sound stages at the WB lot. Tomorrow... We're shooting at a waterfall in Malibu. Like, what kind of job lets you do that? I know. That's awesome. You know, yeah. and the actors in something like Maverick, like, they went through flight training and learned how to barrel roll and nosedive. And, I mean, that's, I'm sure that was intense training. But, again, what an amazing, t uh, amazing time that must be. You, you, what other profession do you get to go and learn something like that? And it's you're very fortunate, I think, when you have like obviously on these big budget movies, like they're paying for you to go through the training or boot camp, whatever that thing is. But even like, let's take something like you for example, because you worked on NCIS and you had to play someone who was in the military. Yeah, I'm guessing you were not in the military, right? No, no, I wasn't. So whose job was it up to to kind of understand 
all of those things that go into playing someone authentically in the army. Right. And you did a fantastic job at that. And I think that's where you see why someone works and why someone does and why they get cast is what's the homework you're putting in to understandings. And granted, trust me, I understand that there's a lot of privilege to be said if you can afford a class, if you're struggling to even like pursue this art form to begin with. Yep. But YouTube is accessible accessible to most people. Yep. And if you're in a position where you can go on YouTube or talk to somebody or reach out to a friend, study someone, literally go down to the VA, or if you're, you know, you're playing whatever it is, just go and observe. See if you can like Yeah. What what are you gonna do to go the extra mile to say, I'm trying to get this job and I'm gonna authentically portray this as much as possible? Well, that's the thing. Like you you don't have to have all the resources right away to start creating. Yep. Um you know, study your favorite actors, study your favorite scenes. There were so many times where I'd be watching something and it'd be like a scene that just caught me. And I was like, I need to transcribe this scene and break it down. I got to yeah. figure out where the actors were when they did this and what, you know, backstory they found for themselves. And that was just something little that I used to do. And, and quite honestly, still do. I'll, I'll watch a great scene. I'm like, dang, that was, that was really cool. And it can be just a moment or it can be a five minute scene. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that there's any reason why you can't start doing the homework and teaching yourself, even if you don't have the resources to move to L.A. or get into an yeah. acting class or anything like that. You've got YouTube um, and you've got content that's already out there. Transcribe it and start writing notes down with each line of dialogue. Be like, what is the thought process here? Why did the yeah. delivery change? Why the tone of the scene shift right here? What's the thought process and the motivation there? Like. You can peel back the layers on your own to an extent to teach yourself as well, um, at least so that you have a good, you know, starting place. And, and it's, it's huge just to even study people. That's something that I do too. Like when I talk to people or interact with my headshot clients that come in, like I'm watching mannerisms. I'm watching eyebrows and eyes and squinches and smirks. And I'm, I'm like, what does that say? What does yeah. that say? Or even even watching a movie or an actor that I admire, I'll catch something that they'll do, and I'll even I'll catch myself just kind of like doing it like silently to myself, I'm like that's mm -hmm. what did that say, you know? And then I'll bring something that I like into my own work at a later time, and not even like forcefully. It'll just come naturally because I studied it before, and then yes. when the time calls for it, it comes out organically. So you can study other people and kind of lock in things that maybe you wouldn't have known or recognized before. I think that's one of the things that makes some of the most interesting and, and dynamic actors out there is the, the those who study other people and study human behavior, nature and yeah. how people exact behavior ex exist in. I mean, I'm, one of my uh, one of my great mentors, and uh, he was my play teacher. So I had a class in college called play, where you basically it's just like games, but to put you in the skin or the skin, put you back in your own version or your childhood again. So like revisit that sense of play, okay. which I think is so important for any actor to, to know how to tap into that sense of play and kind of remove all the restrictions that society and life and bills, all that stuff puts on us. You know, yep. we kind of get rigid and we lose that sense of fluidity and flow and play. And one of the first things of homework, or maybe it was my clown class, but it was still the same teacher. So either way, like our assignment was to go and watch kids play on a playground, not in a creepy way, not in a way like you're sitting there and you're in a trench coat <laughs> yeah. type of like weird shit. I'm talking like you were just supposed to go and just like watch, you know, what, how, how uninhibited these kids are yeah. in their sense of imagination and like to, to, to be able to analyze that. And, and it, it exists. Characters exist all around us. Yep. Your mailman, your, you know, the, the barista, whoever is like around you totally. could be a character. And that's such a great and important thing, I think, for performance. And you can be working on that anywhere, anywhere. And no matter at, at your job that you're at, like while you're potentially, you know, bussing tables or whatever it is, just like looking around at the people, people at watch. you and sit in the break room, yeah. people watch, you can people watch anywhere and you pick up on mannerisms, you pick up on quirks, you pick up on different qualities. And when you really start to just analyze human behavior, there's just so much more than what meets the eye. And then yeah. you start to pack things into your own toolbox that you can use later um, in your own performances or in your own exploration of another character. And like you said, mm. with kids, like something that's like, we, we shoot with, with some younger children as well, headshots, and they come in here and they're usually the most free because they have that sense of imagination and that sense of 
adventure and, and they just don't care, you know? Yeah. And I think as we get older and, and we, we grow up and, and now we got bills to pay and food to put on the table and a job to keep and all this stuff, like we start to narrow in our adventure side and we start to just, mm. you know, hone in on our responsibilities and everything. And that's good, but you lose that sense of imagination and play and the best yeah. actors in the business know how to play. They, they, they know their dialogue, they do their homework, but then they show up ready to throw it all out if need be. If yeah. the director walks in and says, you know what, this whole monologue, skip it. Let's do this, let's change your personality here. Let's add this little element and then we'll bring you in and say this line of dialogue. You gotta be ready to roll with that. And that's, yeah. that's tricky because you've done the homework, but you have to trust that you've done the homework enough that the character is here. And then if you're told mm -hmm. to throw it all out and bring something new in, you can trust yourself to do that. Doing the homework and just like it's like that sham wow or whatever it was, like set it and forget it. Do yeah. all that work and show up and just be ready to play. It's so imp and I even forget to do that sometimes too. As much as I tell myself this all the time, like let it go. Just st you know, I, I catch myself in self tapes all the time, going, okay. You did your you did your version you think you want to do. Yep. You did the version you think they want you to do. Now I'm like, I'm like just let this shit go. Let it go. Like just like shake it off and just like don't try and make this something that you think it's supposed to be. Right. Just let it be what you've done the homework to. And if you've done your homework right, if you've created authentic relationships, you've created an authentic sense of place and moments before and what you're walking into and all of that stuff is fleshed out yep. then whatever you're so long as it's authentic it might not be what they're looking for but okay. at least it was that and that's what you said kind of early on is is so long as you're giving that version that you um is authentic and true to you yeah. i think that's such a great point to to hammer home yeah it's a it's a mentality shift you walk in the audition room knowing who you are and what you bring to the table mm. not a desperation for the role or a desperation to be liked or a desperation to be applauded for what you did but walk in knowing i'm equal here i'm a creative you can't make this movie without people like me mm -hmm. and this is what i'm bringing to this character this is my interpretation take it or leave it you know this is what i'm gonna bring here i'm gonna do it as authentically as i can i did my homework now i'm gonna trust myself and then when i walk out the room i usually i've gotten into a habit i tear up my sides i throw them in the first trash can i see I'm like, such, such a good I did the habit. homework. Don't dwell on it. Don't think about it. Don't call my agent tomorrow. Yeah. Don't, you know, in, in five days, be like looking at your watch going like, when am I going to hear something? Let it go. Yeah. Let it go. You did the work. If it's right, it's going to come back. And it's you know easier, what's ironic? Yeah. A, a lot of times the, the ones you don't think that you yeah, nailed are the ones that come back and they're like, you booked it. Always. I mean, that was the same thing with NCIS. I walked out of that. I was, I, I thought I blew it and, and, and I really didn't. I just stuttered one word, but I kept going, right? I didn't break the character. I stuttered one word and in my head in, in the read, I'm sitting there going like, oh, well, that one's done. Ah. <laughs> and I was so like lost in my thoughts, but I, just, <clears throat> I kept going. And then I remember I walked out, it was on, uh, I think it was on the WB lot and I walked out and I got lost. I couldn't, I couldn't even find my car. I was just so in my head about this. And I started doing loops around the back lot and couldn't find the car. And I ended up calling Savan, my fiance, and I, and I was like, I'm lost. <laughs> Can you swing by Warner Brothers and pick me up? Because I can't find my car. <laughs> and she got in the car. She's like, I'm sure you did fine. I'm sure it was fine. And literally the next morning, I got a call from my manager. He's like, you ready to cut your hair? You're going to be on the show. I was like, oh, my God. OK. All right. So I beat myself up for nothing. And we do that as actors. We, we don't hit it the way we think we should. And, and sometimes that could work to your favor because it just makes it all the more real. You know, real people don't say everything perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I will. You know? Yeah, yeah that this, the, I mean, obviously knowing your lines is important, but being yeah. like right now, I just went like, you know, like that yeah. happens. Everyone thinks we have to be crystal clear and that's so not true. But now the, the real burning question I want to know is how long was your hair that you had to cut it? Was it like a drastic thing that you walked in with? Did you have a mop and you had to cut it or were you, <laughs> were, were you in the ballpark of playing someone in the military? I think I was in the ballpark. I, okay. I, yeah, I mean, my hair maybe a little longer than this, mm -hmm. but they they wanted to go short. They wanted tapered to go and short, military, yeah. tapered. Yeah, and it was one of those like when you get the audition, it's like if you're not willing to cut your hair, don't audition. Don't for even this. Audition, basically don't yeah. waste our time. Like yeah, if you yeah. if you're not willing to cut your hair or shave, don't don't audition. And so 
when my agent or my manager called and he's like, you're ready to cut your hair, I knew exactly what that meant. I yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. Yes, I am. I go through the same <laughs> conversation with my agent because they, they, I, I love having long hair. And we, I mean, you know, because I went and shot with that type of things with my long hair. But they still, yeah. they, there is a negotiation that I think a lot of actors have to, to find where it's like, what is your authentic you and what is the part of the business and for me that means at some points maybe I'm going to have to cut my hair but that's why for me as having headshots I wanted to make sure that I'm covered in all bases you know because right. if they're trying to pitch me and I'm have like my look changes because I'm not sure and that's how it is for some people it's hard to just stay um in one certain thing if that's not like true to what you are or how you feel most comfortable yeah, I mean, even going back to my the the vampire commercial I told you about. I mean, I was a, I was, you know, nineteen years old. I, I wasn't rocking this this you know this this facial hair. Yeah. I was clean shaven. They booked me for it, and actually, no, they didn't book me for it. They they called my agent. And my agent called me, and she goes, "They want to book you for this, but they want to know if you've got any photos of yourself with facial hair." Mm. And I. I was like, no, I've never really grown out facial hair before. I was like, I've let it, you know, be stubble, but it was, I was 19. It wasn't, you know, like, it wasn't like this. Yeah. And so I think 24 hours went by and I just started scouring my Facebook page and my phone. And I was like, I got to find something that yeah. shows what I look like. I think they wanted me to let it grow for this commercial as much as possible, but they needed to know that it grows evenly. Ah. And <laughs> I, I just searched everywhere and I finally found this picture of me. It was like through the reflection of a window in my car or something. But I had some stubble and I sent that to casting. And I was like, I hope this works. Because if I lose this role because I don't have a photo of myself with any facial hair, that's going to suck. Wow. And I sent it and they called me back like 30 minutes later. Like, okay, great. You got the part. I was like, I need a photo with some facial hair. You know, that's so, and this is going to sound even more ridiculous. And I love that story because it just shows how, I mean, we try to think that a lot of producers and creatives are imaginative, but oftentimes they just want to see. And I, I want to I talk more about this in the headshots shortly. And I know I want to, yep. we'll, we'll touch on this. Hopefully you can go a little bit longer. Um, yeah. But it, it, I remember I had a, a, a for a film, the, the sides was written for a character that had blonde hair and blue eyes for this character I did for this. The movie was called Good Old Boy. It wound up changing to, to Growing Up Smith. Um, this film I did, but I auditioned. And I didn't have blonde hair or blue eyes, obviously, at the time. But I auditioned, and they liked me. But I remember they were like, would you be down to shave your – or to dye your hair? Like, do you, or do you have any photos of you with blonde hair? So what I did was I reached out to my friend again, Damien Battinality, who is a retoucher for Peter Hurley. I said, dude, would you be able to Photoshop a picture of me and change my hair to make it look like I have uh, blonde hair and blue eyes? Hair. And I sent that in. I sent that into casting, and they okay. sent that to the, to the, to, to the team. And I booked the part. Now the kicker oh of this gosh. whole thing is, it was to play like the boyfriend for the like the main girl, uh, young girl in the, in the film. The kicker was they didn't even wind up having me dye my hair or wear contacts. But I was so committed to show them that I'm like, I will you. do what you need me to do to get this part, within reason. Uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and that like at the end of the day, <laughs> hopefully that they saw like, okay. That looks right too, but also what he did was right. I'm sure that's the conversation that they had was like, sure, we have an idea in our head. We've gotten that fix out of our mind. Now let's just go with whatever's right. You know, it didn't really matter. So yeah, it's so important totally. to have that flexibility. There, I think that a lot of times writers and casting directors have this vision of what the character should be. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they might not know until they see it. Yeah. And, you know, they might have the vision of the blonde hair, blue, blue eyed guy. And then, you know, a wild card comes in, gives this excellent performance. And then they go, you know what? No, that's the guy. And I've been on that side of the table, too, as a filmmaker. When I moved out here, I, I produced some films and, and we, you know, held the audition process. And, and, you know, I've seen how many submissions come in. And I know what it's like to have my thought and my perception of what the character should be. And then somebody out of the blue walks in. It was my wild card pick. Yeah. And I'm like, no, you're the character. You're the guy. And so that's why it's, you know, you want to show that you're, you're going to do the work and, and that you're willing to, whether it's shave or, you know, if you, if you're willing to change your hair color or whatever, that's all great. But sometimes you just got to go, even on, even on auditions where you don't think it's you or you're, you're not sure why you got called in for it. Just do the work. Yeah. Go in there, lay it all on the table. 
you might be the wild card. It's hard to deny a compelling performance, whether it is right or wrong. I had the same yeah. thing happen because I was casting a, a TV series that I wrote, and it was a comedy series. And I already had somebody who was cast, but they didn't know if they could do it. So we were casting, like we did a round of casting for another character, and we did a casting round for that character just in case. And my buddy wound up being able to do it anyway, my buddy Brock, who was already on the show. Um, but okay. we ca- we, were, we had auditions, and we had a guy come in who was totally not right. like Because we... My buddy Brock is jacked. Like he is a bodybuilder, like to the extreme, okay. like heavyweight bodybuilder type of dude. Big guy. Big guy. And so we okay. were looking for someone's like that. And this person came in and they weren't that, but we were like, damn, whatever they're doing with the material, it works in that way. And we're starting to talk about like, okay, we could write this character a little different and yes. tailor it to his performance. Was more he was more of just like such a cool like bad guy type of like bad boy type, and it just but it was like so e- like so easy and nonchalant with with all the material that we we're like wow this kind of works too, and we were re- yep. like we were ready to book this person had my buddy not been able to like no my 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 thing got changed I can do this it was like okay. a tragedy but uh, <laughs> it, you know it wound up working out but you you it's hard to deny someone who is just a good actor regardless if it's what it you is. had intended. And they will, and I have seen them change the writing to match somebody that they, they want that they didn't know they want. Yeah. Um, kind of like what you just said. It's like, okay, well, we could change, we could, we could switch this around and make this work because that actor is just brought something that, that we can't even put on the page. Mm-hmm. You know, they filled a gap that we didn't even know we had. Yeah. And they came in, and now it's like, now you're the only person I see in this role. What can we do to change the script to match it to you? Mm-hmm. And, and most writers are not actors so they don't really know what what it's going to be unless it's like Sorkin where Sorkin's like I know what this is going to look and sound like and I don't want you doing or Shakespeare whatever it is Mammoth right you know where unless they're that type of person where they've crafted it and it's like this is what I want most writers you know for especially for like uh tv or or you know um independent film it's like they have this idea that they're putting out there and then an actor takes that and ups the ante and then they you right. know, there's an it becomes a marriage of the actor with the writing, and it evolves hopefully to something that is a mixture of of both. Yeah, there's uh, a lot in a performance that's not on the page. Yep, exactly. So you if know? you can just if you can be compelling in your performance and your auditions, I think that's always going to be the most important thing. But I want to I want to talk about the importance of 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 why things like headshots are are, are so important. And Let's before we before we get to that, real quick, is how did that all start for you? Obviously, you were t- doing filmmaking. You're out here pursuing acting. Where did this idea to start doing headshots and and when did that all come into play for you in your life um you know i i i got my first camera when i was still in colorado Mm -hmm. and i i honestly my first real camera i'll put it that way my first real still camera and um started messing around and learning it and self-teaching and and all that and i got into this this zone where i was doing senior portraits and some real estate photography we did some stock and, and product photography and these are, you know, Colorado days before moving out here. And I got here and I, I'd probably say within about six or seven months of moving to LA, I had a friend that I worked with out here and she's an actress and she, she wrote me one day. She's like, hey, I, I was just looking you up and I saw some of your, your photography online. Would you be open to taking my headshots? Mm. And I was like, I've never taken an, acting, an actor's headshot ever yeah um you basically saw my previous work which was in a different lane um but i'm flattered yeah let's do it Uh, let's let's take your acting headshots we'll go find you know a a nice spot with some natural light and maybe an outdoor spot and and we'll just capture some stuff Mm -hmm. and so we went and we did this and she loved the shots and the shots started getting her auditions and then her friends saw the shots and they wanted shots and then their friends' friends saw the shots, and then they wanted shots. Sure. And it kind of snowballed a little bit, and it took me, it was probably like 15 people in, where I was like, maybe I could make this a thing. Like, maybe maybe I have something here in the headshot realm. I mean, I'm certainly in the right spot for it. In LA, there are actors everywhere that need headshots. And um, shortly after I met Savan, she's my, my partner in crime with this business of ours. She... Uh, she and I got together and we're like, let's let's actually build this into a full-on business. Let's do the, let's lay the groundwork. Let's do the homework. Let's get a catalog of work going so that people can see what we do. And when we did that, it just started lighting up. Um, you know, we laid the, the groundwork, and I'd say year after year for about the past six or seven years, we've just been growing and growing. 
And the style that I shoot now has probably been in the works for the last three or four years. And, and we're grateful for it. We get to be creative every day. We get to work with awesome people like you that come in and play with us. And we have this great time capturing these characters and these cinematic moments. And it's fun. But I, I'd say it was kind of a snowball effect yeah. that gave me the spark. And then we laid the groundwork and it just boomed from there. So we're grateful to be doing it. Yeah, and and you do such. I I truly mean this, and I and I've shot with a couple of photographers out here, but I really love the work that you do, and I think you are so passionate about it, and you have it's. It, I I I can only assume this because of my experience with you, and I've shot with you, uh, with you both. Is that like when you have somebody come in, you feel like this is like it's like you're on the day it's like you're you're about to shoot goodfellas or something it's like we're, we're ready to shoot and have fun here and like it's the same energy you'd have for anything else and you feel like this is the most important thing at the moment right now and it's like we're gonna have fun and we're gonna play and i'm coming at this from this way and it's like you have ideas and we're gonna figure out ideas it feels very involved and it feels very important and i and i i feed off of energy like that and i'm sure that's what a lot of your other clients do because the work speaks for itself and it's a very consistent uh type of, of product Thank that you, you put out there and you, you definitely have created the style that i think is i i, I don't want to phrase it like this because i think this is undervaluing what it is but it's the, the truth of what it is at this po moment it is very in right now like what you're doing is very bookable it's very um what people I think casting offices is you're you're seeing people in a very real way and it's mm -hmm. in a very like it's an accurate representation of themselves and it's like the the composition is is very appealing for 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 lack of a better way of phrasing it it's Thanks, like man. every Thanks. every photo seems tasty uh yeah. like you know it's <laughs> tasty, like it's like, I like, like it. it's it's very it's like there's something to it where it's not just the like obviously you can do the plain colors but you're 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 bringing in contrast you're you're bringing in the light in a different way i mean we had fun with that when we did our yeah. this last shoot you know it's like different ways of just creating something new and something that just like speaks for itself and an image that has more than just a face what what about the whole headshot process do you find most enjoyable or where are you trying to find like break new ground how has that all been for you in recent years yeah i think it's um it's it's interesting because headshot trends change uh just like anything in the business yeah and so part of it is keeping up with what others are doing and what's working and what's not working and developing your own kind of kick to everything. And so <clears throat> for us, a big thing right now that's in is character looks. And, yeah. and that's not necessarily character as in quirky, but but looks that are specific. Mm -hmm. You know, this is my guy next door. This is my leading man. This is my um, young mom or young professional. This is my, you know what I mean? To where when you get those auditions that come in, you've got a shot that matches it, which kind of goes along with what you said earlier. Sometimes casting doesn't want to imagine. They just want to see it. Yeah. And I think for whatever reason, that's sort of the trend right now where having one solid theatrical shot that's just a general shot of your face and one solid commercial shot that's a general shot of your face smiling doesn't cut it the same way anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, nowadays a lot of actors come in and they need a lot of looks because they're hitting all these different character types so that when those auditions roll in, they've got the shot to, to match it. Yep. Um, so for us, we, we, we like to pair the backgrounds to match the look as well. Yeah. You know, if, if you're going for a, um, an all American guy next door, I'll probably throw you in front of like this really awesome textured, um, wood fence. It just reads guy next door. It just does. Mm -hmm. When you see the shot, you know exactly what the character is. Um, and so we like getting really specific. You know, when an actor comes in and they show us their wardrobe, we kind of lock in what we're going to do. And, and Savan and I devise a game plan for what the backgrounds are and the lighting style is going to be um, to really sell it. You know, it's, it's, it's all got to come together. The mm -hmm. actor bringing their magic to the table with the expression and their connection to the camera, the wardrobe's got to be on point. And then, you know, the background and the composition and the lighting all play as well. So it's one of those things where, you know, you get lightning in, the, in, in a bottle and it's like, wow, what a great range we captured for somebody. And now I'm confident that you can take these out and submit to any role that comes your way. Yeah, it's and, and it sounds to me like you're kind of like in service of what ways can I make like how can I help you how can how can with the lighting in the background can I help make this an easier um 
image for the casting director to have the imagination to say, I can see this person in this role that I'm looking to cast them, especially like in the, the smaller roles or like co-stars or even guest stars because right. they're moving so fast and it's hard to bring in a, a, a thousand people. You know, how many tapes can these people watch? They're being very selective about the people they're saying yes to. And yeah. You, you know, like if your headshot's you in the middle of a football field with your arms crossed and you're supposed to be playing a baker, like right. it's like yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard for me to say like, yeah, you're taking up one of these 30 I slots that I have that. to sit and watch, a, you know, right. uh, watch today during when I have 18 other roles to cast. Exactly. And, and, exactly. and whereas if they're scrolling and they see it, it's like, oh, that guy for sure. Yeah. Let's call him in. OK, great. Oh, yep. That one. I see it there, too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And they're scrolling fast. They're scrolling. They're, I mean, thousands of audition um, submissions come into these guys. So you need a shot that pops and says what the character is. Yeah. And it's okay to have, you know, a general theatrical shot in, in the mix. Yep. But, um, you know, to go along with that, it's also good to have some uh, specific looks that, that really sell at home too. Well, I think because you people have to understand that you are representing your brand. And that's like what I was – like what we re- recently did a photo shoot. It's like the, the shot that I was looking for, my team was looking for, was like a brand shot. Like this is my brand. Yeah. Like this is the yeah. this is the like, cover is of you. the book. You know, like this is the cover right. of the book. And then when you open that book, there's got to be a whole bunch of different chapters and pages that's that tell the rest of your story. And that's right. what the photos is because there's so much content right now. You're not gonna like it's it's too and there's so much competition that it's not yeah. enough to just have that one shot and think that that's gonna work. It, it, it's like across the board. Yeah, it's like having one tool. Or having one tool, like a hammer, and expecting to be able to build a house, every house with that one hammer. Right. So you need the screwdriver, you need the wrench, you need like (laughs) everything else to like show that, yeah, I can do this job. I can, I have all these different tools. I'm not going to use them at all the times. I can't bring all these to the meeting, but I have them. Right. So I think that's exactly. so that's so it's so important, and it's great that you guys do that and you offer that and you have the skill set to provide that because anybody can have a bunch of different backgrounds and pull sure. down the different backdrop and say, yeah, we can do that. But you understand the technicality, and I think that's why you both as actors, you know, you and Savan, you 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 understand what it's like to to be that person taking the photo and you know say like, yeah, this is going to tell that story. You you understand right. storytelling. You are a filmmaker that. Is, is helping create these compositions and that's well and it all yeah it all it all plays like and I got to give props to Savan I, I can't do this job without her mm-hmm. she's incredible in what she does here and my name might I like to say my name Marquise the business name sure um, it's Cameron Radice photography but like Savan kind of runs the show mm-hmm. she's in a way my assistant director she keeps us on track she's excellent at pairing wardrobe with the right backgrounds um, she's watching every shot as it comes into the monitor and making sure that we're getting it because my head's buried in the camera yeah um, you know and and so we're very much uh, dependent on each other to pull off this operation um, but like you said, being actors or having a history of, of acting and acting experience is really helpful too because there's a lot of photographers that I don't feel have that. And Absolutely so not. They might be able to, to light a wonderful image and compose a great image, but they've never – their shoes haven't been on the other side of the camera before yeah. um, finding the character looks. And I feel like everyone – Everyone somewhere has some sort of a, a, a photography horror experience. And I think for Savan and I, we, we want to dispel that when people walk in. Like yeah. we're, we're friends hanging out, creating something cool together, you know, and we, we keep it very down to earth and very chill. But because I think we have that experience, you know, in their shoes, we can connect in different ways yeah. than we would if we were just photographers. And I think you said something that really just kind of illuminated this to me is I think the combo of having both of you because it is so hard to see everything when your face is buried in the camera like you said. It is like it's impossible to to see yeah. every nuance of what's going on with the person, understanding their emotional, like how they're feeling at the moment, like understanding like all of their their wardrobe things, what what is the best, you know, game plan for them as a as an actor like in their business to like see every little tiny thing. And for you to be focusing on the lighting and where everything is positioned. Yeah. I think that's what sets you guys apart. I think that having the combo of you two, because most photographers, it's just themselves. And obviously there's probably financial reasons for that um, for, for, for one <laughs> sure, for one sure. part of it you know they're they're like yeah, yeah i need to i can't afford to hire somebody for or whatever it is but i so think I'm flying solo yeah, yeah for and, sure. and, and that makes sense but i think that you miss out on that second perspective and strategy that you both kind of bring to the table and i think that is what is a part of what makes you both so great and the experience so well worth every penny and more 
it, it, it's really that, magical. Man. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. No, I, I, it's really comforting for me to know I got a second pair of eyes that are watching the monitor. Yeah. And if, you know, if, if there's a button that is kind of off center at the bottom of the shirt in the frame, like she'll see that, you know, I might not see it because I'm looking at the actor's eyes. And I'm looking at my background and my composition, but you know, maybe maybe the shirt's a little twisted at the bottom, and I got her eyes over here. Yeah. That's like, hold on a second, let's fix this. It's, you know, it, it, it's so crazy because, and, and I, I joke about this with Allie, who's you know my fiance for everybody here who knows. Like when we're doing self tapes, I put, I mean, we, you know, us as actors, we put so much pressure on the people oh we're doing self tapes with, and yeah. like, so we'll be doing a scene. She's got to make sure that the camera's right, make sure I'm in frame, make sure that you know I look good, and also that they're doing a good job as a reader. Right. Making sure my eye line is good. Make sure they don't make a noise. <laughs> yeah, all these things. So like, I'll, I'll have times where I get kind of, you know, not angry, but I'm like, I'm upset. Where like, I have this thing where we joke. It's called my like a, a serial killer hair, where I have like one piece of hair that's like <laughs> like this or something okay. like that, and it looks just like I call it my serial killer strand, where it's like you know messy, and I'm like, no, I have serial killer hair in this thing, and that looks ridiculous. But like, she's like, I'm worrying about a billion other things. I can't be right. like, you know, she's not seeing that. Yeah, right. So there's having, so many things to keep track of um, for actors and self tapes, just the same, like you said. And you can get through an entire take for a self tape and go back and be like, it's a great performance, but that hair. Is yeah. doing this right here. <laughs> it's like, it, but you it, know, it, to some degree though, you also have to separate yourself and go, okay, that one piece of hair might be doing this slightly. Is that is that killing the shot? Is that killing the performance? Yes. Um, or did you capture the character? Yep. Right. A lot of times too with headshots, actors come in and they're they forget that they're creating a character. They forget that they're creating an emotional connection with the camera. And then when they look at the shot, they're just looking at the shot for themselves. Yes. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves, like, okay, but does this read as the character I came in to capture? Mm -hmm. I came in looking for young mom. Does it read young mom? Is the expression hitting? Is the connection there? If it is, if there's one flyaway hair or one like crease in the shirt down here by your belt line, yeah. it doesn't matter. You captured the magic in the moment and casting is not going to scroll through and either look at a, a self tape or at a headshot and go, mm, this person would be good, but that one button is a yeah. little off center. Nah, skip it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, you, there's so much here right now that we could talk about because it, it touches upon like our own distorted view of ourselves, which is like probably yeah. a big problem you deal with with people is that Absolutely. we, they're, they're, as a headshot photographer, you're almost setting yourself up for certain people where <laughs> nothing is ever going to satisfy them. So there's like nothing you can do at the end of the day that's going to satisfy someone's own personal thing. But an objective right. view is going to, you might have 10 of your friends go, that looks amazing. That is exactly what it is. But you, you have your own view of how you want to look and certain things that yep. may or may not be right for the acting business where right. like, you know, you look best when you're like this and yep, your you things like your this. Angle. Yeah. And that yeah, might, yeah. you might look good. That satisfies you, but it's not satisfying the job that the ultimately the casting office or whoever is looking at that is trying to fulfill. Right, and I, right. I feel like that's a, a very big struggle to overcome. And also like you're saying, if the buttons messed up, there's a flyaway hair. That's what Photoshop is for. That's where sure. Photoshop is for. Spot touch that baby yes. out. If it's, if Spot it's a healing, tiny, baby. Just, it's gone. Yes. Did you capture the character? Great. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, it, there's a difference between a, a, a flyaway hair and the fact that if you have like pizza sauce all over your face. Exactly. There's, right. You like, know? If it's something glaring where it's like, okay, maybe the character's there, but the shot doesn't work because yes. you just walked away and took a bite of something and your teeth are full of, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's, let's get back in there and find it again. But it's true. Uh, people see themselves differently than other people see them. And so that's another reason why it's also good to have somebody else help you select your shots. Because when you mm. go through your shots, um, you're probably looking at things that other people aren't noticing. Yes. Like for me, if I see myself in a shot, I'm like, this eye is slightly smaller than this eye, you know? And I'm like, that shot doesn't work because I, I never would have. see it. I never would have. see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody else is looking at that. Yes. But we you know? all know this about ourselves. Yes. We know this about ourselves. We spend our lives looking in the mirror, fixing our hair, analyzing everything we don't like. And, and then, you know, you get in for a photo and then you forget that you are pursuing an acting career, creating a character, and you're here to create a character just like you would on the set of NCIS or yeah. any big show. And and we get into this mindset of looking at our own face and deciding how it is supposed to look. When the mm. reality is, did you do the homework? 
Did you find the thought? Did you connect? Is that the character? If that's the character and it books you a job that's huge and life changing, does the button even matter? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's, it's give and take. You got to know what, what, you know, if there's a glaring issue, you got to know to get in there and fix it. If it's something where it's like, man, the moment is there, I'm going to snap the shot, even though there's one little fly away, there's Photoshop for that. Yeah. You can get rid of that just as easily. And if you capture the shot, that's, that's what matters most. Absolutely. What are you, what are, what are some of the things you think that, I, I hate to generalize this as a big thing, but I think it's important and maybe not in the traditional sense of like, um, showing up on time or whatever. Like, what are the biggest mistakes you see actors come in and kind of, or, or not necessarily mistakes, but what are ways that actors are hurting themselves and not giving themselves the best opportunity for a, um, the ultimate experience that they could have uh, getting their headshots done. What are you What are you seeing people do that kind of hinder having that you know ultimate experience that they that they desire? Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag. I think we've touched on a couple of them. Um, not being willing to play mm -hmm. is a big one. If you come in and you, you you don't want to explore stepping outside of your safe zone, you know what I mean? Your, your comfort zone. It's hard to capture that magic authentically. Um, so that's a big one. I think if, if you come in here with an open mind, ready to just play and kind of take direction on the flow and, and, you know, work with me, mm. then you're already 10 steps ahead of the, the, the rest. Um, another big thing though, is, is just simply following directions. I mean, when you get an audition notice, and there's a list of directions or requirements or specifics, if you will, um, about the way you tape or what they need to see or what they want you to say for your slate or something like that, and you don't follow it, it's easy for casting to, to go, well, they didn't follow directions here. Can they be trusted on set mm -hmm. to do what they're told, be there on time, you know, be professional? Um, so... On our end, you know, when you book a session, we send out a, a, an email that's kind of a preface of how it's going to go, what forms of payment we accept, where our location is, what the parking is. You know, we send, we, we even go the extra mile. We send out a wardrobe lookbook for people. Yeah. So, like, if you don't know what a guy next door wears, open up the PDF we send. There's like 12 pictures of different outfits that would sell that concept or that character. Go to your closet, pull it together, and and come in with something that, that's like it. Um, and there's a lot, I, I, a lot of times where I, I think maybe people don't look at the details of even our emails that go out, mm. um, or they come in and they say, yeah, I, I want to go for guy next door or girl next door, but I just, I didn't know what to wear. And my initial thought is like, did you look at the wardrobe <laughs> examples that I sent you? I, and I, and I like, cause it's there, like mm -hmm. I did the homework for you. Um, so, so my hope is always that you look at the details, look at the details of what we send you, or if you book a job on set, read every word you're investing, right? You're investing in yourself. You're, you're going to capture something that's crucial for what you're trying to achieve in the business. Read every word, be totally prepared, be professional, um, and know what you're coming into and then be ready to play, be ready to have fun. Savan and I are very down to earth. We, we throw quips back and forth. We play great music while we're here. Um, and it's just a fun experience if you let yourself have fun. And some people come in with nerves that are tight and so tense that they forget to have fun in the moment. And I know that's kind of handcuffing for people too. So if you can leave your nerves at the door or at least come in, get to know us for 10 minutes and then go, okay, these guys are cool. Yeah. I can throw all my nerves aside. Let's just have fun. You're going to have um, an awesome time here. And it shows in the photos. Yes. When somebody's loose and has fun, it shows in the photos. Absolutely. What is, just for fun, what is your, maybe it's not a color, but what is your favorite thing to photograph? Whether it's a color or a texture, what is like the thing that you always are like, yes, that's I, that always produces good results. Like if somebody's curious <laughs> of what they should wear or what they should sure. do, like what is a good combo or color? Like what do you find the best results often for you? Um, yeah, this, come through. That's, that's interesting because like there are some like staple pieces that, are always fun to photograph. Like I know a lot of people do a leather jacket, but it's fun to photograph. Something yeah. with a good collar, a good jacket is awesome. My least favorite thing to photograph is single layer wardrobe. Like if you come in with just a, um, a t-shirt and there's no texture to it and there's nothing, there's no, it doesn't say much of anything. Yeah. It's just not as fun to photograph, but people that come in with like a cool layer 
or something that offsets or a jacket with a great collar or something like that, I love photographing really great jackets. Yeah. Like they come in and they, they stack their clothes up and I pinpoint the jackets right away. I'm like, that's a dope jacket. Like I'm yep. excited to photograph that. It's going to look awesome. Yeah. Layers create dimensionality on, on camera. Mm -hmm. And so when you have, you know, either a two layer effect or a three layer effect with a great collar, it just looks, it looks cool and adds to different types of compositions and lighting things that I do. And I, so I love a good jacket. Yeah. One of my favorite shots that I got with you guys is when I'm wearing my green jacket with like the orange little tones and the white shirt and my fedora hat like that. And the way that the lighting is hitting the, the hat and the way it's accenting my face. Like yep. I, I love that shot. I think that is you know, it's a beautiful marriage of where the wardrobe is giving you that little extra oomph to, to tell you what this character is. And it's also like everything's complementing each other. It's all kind right. of in synergy. Um, and that's it where I think together. knowing the color of the lights or the gels or the way you're bouncing the light off of that's where all of that what you do is helping to uh, tell that same story. I think like you were like you were saying earlier. Right. No, I mean, if, if you come in here and you know kind of what, what your characters are that you play and you bring the wardrobe that matches it, you're in for a treat. I, you know, if you come in here with five different colored plain t-shirts and say, this is cop, this is lawyer, <laughs> this is detective, this is nurse, like, okay, they can be whatever you want them to be in your own mind, yeah. but do they say that through the camera? Like, yeah. if nobody talks to you, do they know that that t-shirt says cop? Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that's also not to say, you know, you got to come in here with a cop uniform. Like you, there's this like healthy balance of like suggesting the role without going overboard too. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't want to take it to be this kitschy character -y thing, you know, you can wear a nice suit with a blue button down, unbuttoned and a loose tie. And suddenly you're a detective. Very true. You're rolling up on the scene. You're like, what do we got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's, it, it, it's, it, you can suggest these characters, um, without hitting it over the nose. Yeah. And, and it, it's this healthy balance of finding the, those wardrobes and those, those options that make it come together. And where the lines are too, because like you just said, if you play, if you, if you're wearing the cop uniform, then you're that's a cop but the suit it's like you can do lawyer you could do business person you can right. do there's so many ways because it would be nearly impossible to photograph every single profession in the world that exists like you're gonna go to party exactly. city and just say i'll take everything and then like you, you know like <laughs> like that's just yeah. not realistic so you have to but, kind of also but, know yeah. yourself too and what what are the things that you're gonna play so that way they don't you don't go in there and kind of have terrible expectations i think as well as like an understanding yeah. of yourself Right. I mean, it's the same thing with like, um, you know, if you come in here wanting a quirky look, I somewhat expect that you've got that quality that you bring to your acting. Um, but if, you know, if you come in here and say, I'm, this is my quirky look, tell me how to be quirky. Uh. I'm like, okay, you got, that's where you bring your element to the table. Right. Yeah. Um, same thing though with a suit, like you can do different versatile things with a suit. Like, like I can throw you in front of one kind of moodier look background and, and you're a detective and then I'll throw a, uh, a white clean background behind you. We'll take the tie off, open the shirt up a little bit, and suddenly it's this socialite bachelor look. Mm. You know, like same suit, two backgrounds, two very different characters. Yeah. Button the shirt up, put the tie back on. Now you're an attorney. You know, it, it you pick looks that are versatile for you and fit in areas that you know you play really well. Like for me as an actor, I play um, intellectual <laughs> characters very well. Everything I book, I'm either in a suit, clean shaven, hair slicked. Um, I'm always that kind of character. I would be a doctor on a show. I would be a lawyer on a show. Um, the tough um, dialogue is like my expertise on set. And, and I know that about myself. Those intellectual characters are my, my shtick. So when I go into my own headshots, I'm like, what would capture what I play best? Mm. Because that's what I'm going to book the most. It's so important. And not only for yourself as an actor to have that separately, that knowledge about where you fit in in this industry and where are you going to have better shots, I think, than, you know, like <laughs> that's kind of like the idea that you put in my head is like I imagined like someone like real – like real big guy with a deep booming voice going, all right, I'm ready to do my quirky shots. Like, and just being like, <laughs> right, right. like, it's like, maybe you can find, maybe you can like really work, but it's just like, sure. you have to really know how to make the most out of your time and money because you can't sit there all day and pull this stuff out of people. It's like, right. Where right. are you going to find your value? And it sounds like you have to, it's, it's truly like a performance. It's like, you have to prepare yeah. like a performance. Yeah. What are the, 
wild, I'm sure there are a lot of things that you can get in the spontaneity of things and you'll find the magic in just being organic and natural. But like, especially when you're trying to capture that such a wide palette, it's like, mm-hmm. where does that palette live for you? If you don't, if you're trying to figure that out with you, that's 20 minutes down the drain of your, of your session. And then you've, right. you've lost out. Right. You, you kind of want that, that homework to be done before you come into a headshot session. Yeah. So you can walk in and say, this is what I play. And these are the options I brought for it. Um, basically, you know, what do you think will photograph better? But, but this is my, this is what I do. And I'm like, okay, if, if you play quirky, then this is what I think works better than this. Yeah. Um, but if you come in with your entire wardrobe, your entire closet or a suitcase, which is crumpled up clothes and everything, like tons of pieces for me to sift through that does eat up into your session. Cause now I'm trying to help you figure out what you play. Yeah. But that homework honestly should be done as much as possible before you get here. Yeah, yeah. Just by knowing yourself, knowing your own qualities and your own, you know, being realistic about where you fit in um, in the TV and film world. This has been so brilliant, Cameron. I'm so glad we got to sit and chat. Uh, we, we end all of our episodes uh, as the nature of this podcast is the Points of Experience podcast. We like to ask our guests, um, is there an experience you've had in your life? And this doesn't have to be relative to the industry or not, but like an experience or, you know, that could be in the form of words of wisdom or an experience on, shet, on set or experience photographing someone or walking down the street or in an old job you had or growing up as a kid, you know, with some people we've had on talk about you know the experience of having kids is there an experience you've had in your life that had a profound impact on you in a way that if i asked you this question right now it would be the first thing that would kind of like come to your mind and be like yeah that's something if i passed on this story or this experience that might have an effect on somebody in some way uh whether through the lesson you learned or just simply going through it <clears throat> Ooh, that's that's tricky yeah i know um, there's a lot of them but i like to see if we can yeah, find the minds yeah. the the little right? uh, the little yeah. gems that you know oftentimes are unique to each person and like for instance uh you know i i've, I've talked about many of these before but I'll, I'll never forget the the it kind of goes on to what you said being in an audition and taking chances i remember i i was doing this audition for for uh fox and you know everyone always says make bold choices and i took there was a, supposed to be a character that throws a beer can through a, a window and obviously you can't do that on set especially in their casting office at the time when you go in so i made this decision to take my sides and like throw them like I was throwing the thing and the sides went like this and it took like <laughs> 10 to 20 seconds for them to finally to fall down. around the room and in my head I was so embarrassed I'm like I totally ruined this and they were kind of looking at me like all right thank you and I thought I blew it but and I thought they never would call me back in again but they kept calling me in so even though it was kind of ridiculous I'm sure that that was a moment of them going like Oh, somebody did something unique. Granted, again, within the confinements of not, like, hurting somebody or doing anything, but I think I made a a bold choice to say, okay, there was, like, this character was really angry. That was the whole scene. It was about this character (laughs) taking this beer can and throwing it to a thing and, like, celebrating and be like, like, fuck that! Ah!" (laughs) You know, to, like, mind that I felt like would have been so, like, depriving of my physicality. And having that freedom for me gave me such, you know, like, liberation to say okay i did it i didn't burn a bridge i took a risk i took a chance and that kind of set the the bar for me and other things to like always try and find that risk is there like you know i'm not saying it has to be an audition scene or anything but like something like that that stands out um i think a sentiment that i would leave that's a life lesson that i that i have slowly learned over time and i wouldn't even say there's anything in particular that happened that has kind of taught me this just life in general is to come to a place where you can you can accept things that are not right for you in order to accept things that are right for you. And like you just said, taking a risk is a part of that. Um, nothing great ever happens without risk. And for me, I was the first person in my family to pack my bags and move out of state. And at the age of 19, I've got a, a photo of my mom and I sitting outside the parking lot of a Panera Bread with my little Subaru loaded up. I didn't even have a suitcase, just socks and underwear just jammed in the trunk with whatever you know miscellaneous stuff that I had. And I think for me, taking that one risk, saying I don't know if this path is for me yet, but I'm willing to find out. Mm. Um, was enough for me um, to pass that on to others. If there's something that you love or something that you are interested in or you you think you want to explore, um, I think you owe it to yourself to explore it. 
And like I said, I was the, I was the first person to move out of state in my family and it was a risk that um, while I miss home and I miss my family, I wouldn't change it for anything. I met the love of my life out here. Um, and as soon as I met her, it was like, okay, now if the acting never comes through the way I want it to, if the headshot business never booms the way I want it to, I think I got what you know I came here for. Yeah. My path was directed this way. I accepted that this was the direction I needed to go. I took the risk. Um, and it's just made me who I am today. And, and you know, I'll be somebody uh, different in another five years. In another five years, you know, we keep t training ourselves and learning things about ourselves. We never stop learning about ourselves. So for me, it's, it's um, be willing to accept things that, that are clearly for you. That's so uh, perfect because I think we've, we find we can become so stagnant if we don't at least keep walking to different like crossroads and you might take a different path than you thought you would, but at least it brings you kind of further down this road of explore self exploration and, and finding things that you may have not thought you needed, whether that's a friend or a loved yeah. one or a, a hobby or a career. If you don't keep walking and keep going and saying yeah. yes to things or whatever that might be, you just kind of, are in that same place that maybe you're happy where you are and that's fantastic but I think a lot of people yearn I know I yearn for constant like self discovery yeah. and, and um, exploration next, of this right? world yeah so what's through the next door so you gotta be willing to take that next step to get there amazing and, and you find out if that door is for you or if you just gotta move on to the next door heck yes I love that I think that's a perfect way to end this episode Cameron thank you so much for coming on and sharing so much amazing insight and information especially because Headshots I think is such a, a, a important uh, conversation to have and there's so much strat I mean we just scratched the surface here talking about what goes into this what's, what seemingly feels like one you know tool in your toolbox because you sure. know there's so many other websites reels blah, blah 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 but even in the headshot there's so much work that can be done into making sure you have the best experience but uh absolutely you and savan do such great work uh uh cameron radice photography.com or cameron radice.com it's it's radice photography radice photography .com. Com. And on Instagram, it's Cameron Radice Photography. So you can find us there as well. So everybody, please go and check that out. If you do decide to book a session, make sure you read the pamphlet and the homework and the PDF <laughs> and look at all those things because they put a lot homework. of hard work in there. And it's making your job a lot easier at the end of the day. But I highly recommend them as someone who's been through um, their services myself. Uh, all my love to Savan. Uh, I have to see you guys again soon. Hopefully we'll get to catch up, but this has been a Absolutely, real treat. Man. And thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. It's been a it's been a, a wonderful conversation I think people are going to love. Of course, man. Thanks so much for having me. I love being here. You're awesome, and I love what you're doing with the podcast and everything <laughs> else. So keep it up. Ah, you're too much. Thank you so much, dude. We'll, we'll talk all right. soon, all right? All right, sounds good, man. Cameron is actually one of the, I, I've said this to Allie because, you know, when we came out here, we were really hoping to meet like a group of friends and people that we are genuinely like good people. And Cameron is one of those people where he is such a genuine human being and kind of just is like such a nice guy that you'd almost believe like, what is this person's deal? How are they so nice? Like it, he's just a really like down-to-earth compassionate human being and honestly what you see is what you get he just really is kind of a lover of the arts and there's like from just someone who cares about art and humans and people and he's been such a great uh friend to to meet out here and he's just extremely talented too i there's nothing more inspiring than having groups of friends or friends that you know that do great work and inspire you in different ways and different forms and help you want to grow and help you want to learn. And that's even what this podcast has become is just different ways for me to say, yeah, these people are doing all these cool things. I want to keep growing and exploring. And Cameron is um, a great shining example of somebody who has that entrepreneurial spirit and made a business out of something in LA where, you know, you could very easily fall into having to be a waiter while you're pursuing a career as an actor. And now he's doing filmmaking and creating content and doing something, working with actors, growing himself in this industry while also doing something that he loves and has fun with and is extremely passionate about. 
I'm extremely envious of that. And that's what I did when I was living in New York. I would make reels for people. I had my first company was called Uptown Artists. And we would write scenes and make websites for people, the whole gamut of different resources that actors need. So um, if you're interested in headshots, I highly recommend checking out their stuff. It is such a fantastic experience. And their new studio, which I'm sure is even more amazing. Um, But yeah, Cameron and Savan are truly uh, um, some great people. And if, if something you're nervous about is getting headshots and not being in a, in a environment where you feel like you can let loose and be yourself and have a good time, I guarantee you, you will not have that problem with them. You know, some photographers are, are rigid and stiff and they're not the most like, you know, uh, inviting of creating a, a a calm and, and inviting environment just simply out of the nature of them being more technical. And I know he says he's technical, but he's also just like a very down to earth and loose, normal person. You can have a normal conversation with him while you're shooting or have fun and laugh and joke. And he'll bring that into the shots. So check out their stuff. Um, Redis and, uh, it'll be on the descriptions, but yeah, what a fantastic person. Thank you all. Once again, leave reviews on Apple podcasts, Spotify, all that great stuff and subscribe to us on YouTube. It really means a lot to us. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on the next one.